As the new millennium dawned, the Star Trek franchise had fallen far from its height in the mid-90s. Star Trek Deep Space Nine and Voyager had both come to an end after seven seasons. The Next Generation crew had successfully transitioned from a smash hit television show to a series of big screen adventures. However, by 2002, even this iconic ensemble wasn't enough to prevent their last feature film outing Star Trek Nemesis from becoming a derided financial bomb. A pervasive feeling of oversaturation, fatigue, and pop cultural irrelevance was hanging over the franchise like a sword of Damocles. For those viewers who still wanted to seek out new life and new civilizations, all eyes turned to an ambitious but troubled new incarnation of Star Trek on the small screen. <laughs> Towards the end of the 90s, as Star Trek Voyager was coming to a close, the executives at Paramount Television as well as UPN once again tasked producer Rick Berman with creating another Star Trek spin-off show. Although ratings for Star Trek Voyager never reached the heights of the next generation, it still commanded a loyal enough audience whose regular viewership made the series into UPN's flagship show, and the executives at the network were keen to have the recognisable Star Trek brand continue to be a core pillar of their programming. However, in contrast to the creation of Deep Space Nine and Voyager, Berman was no longer conjuring a new series from as secure a position. The Next Generation was a hit in the ratings and proved detractors wrong by becoming the new definitive incarnation of the franchise. But by this point in time, Star Trek's pop cultural presence had faded, and this new series had to pull double duty by both expanding the Star Trek universe and revitalising the franchise. To this end, Berman enlisted the help of writer-producer Brannon Braga, whom he had worked with on TNG and Voyager to create this new series. They decided quite quickly to go for a prequel series instead of a show set after Voyager. This was counter to the expectations of the executives, who were more keen on a future show, perhaps set in the 26th century. Berman and Braga were instead more interested in exploring the era after First Contact, and see humanity's first steps into a larger universe. They even went so far as to have the first season take place almost entirely on Earth in their original pitch. Season 1 would depict the building of the first Enterprise getting fast-tracked following First Contact with Klingons, and only in the very final episode would the Enterprise actually launch. The focus would be on the characters and how they come together as a crew. These characters would be much closer to contemporary people, as opposed to the more enlightened human beings seen in the 24th century. This radical take on a Star Trek show was also embodied in the title itself, which left off the Star Trek name altogether, instead simply being titled Enterprise. Enterprise. While Paramount and UPN executives liked some aspects of the pitch, they ultimately pushed Berman and Braga to not have the first season take place on Earth, and instead make sure the Enterprise and its crew ventured out into unexplored space much sooner. Berman and Braga obliged, instead folding most of these ideas into the pilot episode. Despite these changes, the duo were able to retain the core idea of this new Star Trek show, with Berman saying, We'll be seeing humanity when they truly are going where no one has gone before. We are seeing people who don't take meeting aliens as just another part of the job. It's not routine. Nothing is routine. Also, by bringing it back 200 years from Voyager, we're making the characters closer to the present, and by doing that, they can be a little more accessible and a little more flawed, and a little bit more familiar to you and me. On writing the pilot, Braga commented, We had to basically come up with a story that would give Enterprise a reason to go on its first mission, other than, let's just launch and go out and have our first adventure. We wanted to give Archer a specific noble goal, a test, an incident that would test humanity's ability to prove themselves, and kinda piss off the Vulcans too. I had an image of Klingons in small town America. My first image was, what if we show Klingons attacking Iowa? Then we pared it down to, what if a Klingon crashed in a cornfield? From that initial concept, Braga and Berman created a pilot in which the crew of the NX-01 Enterprise would depart Earth on a mission to bring Klang, the stranded Klingon, back to his homeworld, coming into conflict with the mysterious Sulabon. After becoming inadvertently entwined with the political machinations of the Klingon Empire and Sulaban Cabal, the Enterprise crew successfully stopping the outbreak of a war would prove humanity would have what it takes to go boldly where no one has gone before. Due to Enterprise's status as a prequel long before even the original series, the goal with this new cast of characters was to have a more flawed group of mostly humans. 
A non-human character on the crew, though, was always intended to be a Vulcan. Braga originally came up with the idea of using the character T'Pau, originally seen in the original series episode Amok Time, but in her younger years as a Vulcan scientist. However, as pre-production continued, legal concerns were raised concerning the estate of Theodore Sturgeon, who had originally created the character T'Pau. Therefore, T'Pau was changed to an original character named T'Pol. After a rigorous search for the right actress for the part, Berman and Braga offered the role to Jolene Blaylock. Blaylock was a huge fan of Star Trek the original series, her favourite character, funnily enough, being Spock. She had been acting and occasionally modelling from a very young age, landing her first television role in Veronica's Closet. Prior to Enterprise, she played Medea in the TV movie version of Jason and the Argonauts, and starred in the TV miniseries Diamond Hunters. For the Enterprise's tactical officer, Berman and Braga wanted a character who was something of a throwback, a stalwart British soldier, very by the book and highly disciplined, but also reserved and shy. The character of Lieutenant Malcolm Reed was the result of this. Soon after Berman and Braga had created the role, actor Dominic Keating auditioned for a part in Star Trek Voyager's seventh season. While Keating didn't land that role, a year later his agent received a call from Berman, who believed Keating was perfect for Reed. After an audition, the part was his. Before Enterprise, Keating cut his teeth in his native England as a regular on the show's Desmonds, as well as guest appearances in shows like The Bill. He transitioned to the United States by landing a number of roles in independent film, before making regular guest appearances in shows such as Poltergeist The Legacy, G vs. E, and Buffy the Vampire Slayer. For the ship's helmsman, originally the writer-producer duo came up with a character named Joe Mayweather, before this was changed to Travis Mayweather. As a natural extension of the early warp-capable decades of human society, Berman and Braga envisioned a culture of people who were born and raised entirely in space. Therefore, Mayweather would have a natural knack for navigating the unexplored regions of the galaxy. Anthony Montgomery was cast in the role. His first television acting job was on an episode of Beyond Belief, Fact or Fiction, hosted by Jonathan Frakes. Throughout the late 90s, he performed in a number of minor roles, such as acting in comedy sketches on The Jay Leno Show and in an episode of Stargate SG-1, before landing his part on Enterprise. The Enterprise's Doctor was conceived and cast before the character had a full name, or a name for his species and homeworld. Fleshing out the character was a collaborative effort between Berman, Braga, and actor John Billingsley who was cast in the role. Billingsley embraced the idea of a happy-go-lucky character, an alien party animal. The name Phlox emerged quite organically from this type of personality. Originally, Phlox's species were named Nurians, but later in development this name was dropped. Phlox's species is in fact never named in the pilot script, and it was only later as writing for the first season began that Berman and Braga came up with the name for the Denobulans. Billingsley had a long career before Enterprise, beginning in the late 80s where he broke into films in the thriller Seven Hours of Judgment. By the late 90s, he was a frequent guest star in shows such as NYPD Blue, LA Doctors, and The X-Files. He was also a regular in the cancelled science fiction series The Others, and acted alongside Jolene Blaylock in G vs. E before they starred together in Enterprise. As a nod to Star Trek the original series, it was felt appropriate to have a communications officer as one of the regular characters, especially useful during the time period when universal translators were not yet prevalent. To this end, the character of Hoshi Sato was created as a kind of audience POV character. She would be highly intelligent, but also extremely nervous, having never left Earth before. Korean-born American actress Linda Park landed the role after a strong audition. She developed a keen interest in acting from a young age, making it her profession while she was still in high school. After graduating from Boston University, she continued acting on stage while also applying for feature films, landing a small role in Jurassic Park 3. For the chief engineer character, Berman and Braga wanted to channel a similar energy to Dr. McCoy, someone who was brilliant in their field but who struggled to understand alien perspectives. Thus they created Charles Tucker, who originally had the nickname Spike. However, due to the popular Buffy the Vampire Slayer also featuring a character called Spike, this nickname was changed to Charlie. It was only in the final draft of the pilot episode that Tucker, being the third in the line of Charles Tucker's before him, that his nickname Trip finally appeared. While casting the part, Paramount and UPN favoured Eric Close for his role in the short-lived CBS show Now and Again, but Berman pushed for Connor Trenier instead, who ultimately won the role. To play Tucker, Trenier took inspiration from his grandparents who were from southern Missouri and Arkansas to create the character's trademark Southern American accent. 
Before Enterprise, Tronier had been landing regular work on television, appearing in Sliders, Freaky Links, and the acclaimed TV movie 61. Rick Berman and Brandon Braga envision the captain of this Enterprise as Captain Kirk meets Chuck Yeager, and often pushed for a Harrison Ford type when batting around casting ideas. The character was initially named Jackson Archer, with most characters referring to him as Jack in early drafts of the script. However, this was changed to Jonathan Archer because, as it turned out, there was exactly one person called Jackson Archer in the United States, so the name was changed to avoid any potential legal trouble. Actor Simon McCorkendale claimed he was offered the part, but turned it down. However, Brandon Braga has insisted the only man they ever seriously considered for the role was Scott Bakula. When studio executives also suggested the actor for the part, the duo jumped at the chance. They soon had a meeting with Bakula where they explained the character and the show. The actor was soon quite keen on accepting the part. He remembered, They talked about going back to a feeling of more of the Kirk-Spock-Bones relationship on board. It would be more about the relationship between the crew and the captain and his officers, as opposed to a relationship to the universe. And that, right away, was very appealing to me. Scott Bakula made his television debut in the 1986 TV movie I Man. After two more television movies, The Last Fang and Infiltrator, Bakula struggled to find regular work as the sitcoms Gung Ho and Eisenhower and Lutz, which he starred in, were both cancelled after a single season. However, he eventually found success in 1988 when he, of course, starred in Quantum Leap, which shot the actor to stardom and made him a household name in the States. After Quantum Leap ended in 1993, Bakula continued to find success on the small and big screen. Though not being overly familiar with Star Trek, he was excited and intrigued by the character of Captain Archer, and so when he was offered the role, he happily accepted. For the production of this new series, it was felt none of the existing Star Trek sets could be reused as the show was taking place in a completely different time period. Herman Zimmerman once again came on board as production designer. Zimmerman, Berman, and Braga wanted to lean into a more realistic, modern aesthetic. For inspiration, they toured a US Navy nuclear submarine and were struck by how cramped the interior of the vessel was. They sought to move away from the luxurious open spaces of the 24th century Starfleet vessels, and instead wanted this first Enterprise to be more practical and compact. The one exception to this was the bridge design, which skewed closer to the bridge seen in the original series. The exterior of the ship was a collaborative design by Zimmerman and CG illustrator Doug Drexler. Originally, the craft was named SS Enterprise, but was later given the NX-01 registration and referred to in dialogue as a proper noun. It was the first time no studio model was created for the ship. Instead, the visual effects for Enterprise were almost entirely digital. The scale of the production was much larger than many expected, considering the scope of the plot. But because of the number of new sets and locations which were acquired, and the writers once again opening the series with a two-part episode, principal photography resembled a feature film rather than a TV show. The schedule was long and grueling, but allegedly Scott Bakula worked hard to keep spirits high. Aside from John Billingsley, the rest of the Enterprise cast were quite young and had relatively little experience compared to Bakula. Therefore, according to the other cast members, Bakula made the effort to be as reassuring and accommodating as possible to the younger cast members a welcoming presence which, according to Linda Park, turned Bakula into a kind of father figure on set. The pilot episode was directed by James Conway, a veteran of Star Trek television by that point. According to Conway, the filming went quite smoothly overall, despite the length of the schedule. The only hiccup came in post-production concerning the aspect ratio. For much of the shoot, it was up in the air if Enterprise would be broadcast in a square 4x3 ratio like previous Trek shows, or in a wider 16x9 ratio, as was slowly becoming the standard at the time. It was only at the last minute that UPN committed to a 16x9 ratio, which meant Conway had to work with the editors to reframe several shots in post. The computer-generated visual effects also proved to be quite a challenge. Paramount's in-house visual effects team joined forces with their regular vendors Foundation Imaging and Eden FX to create 300 shots for the pilot alone, a huge undertaking at the time for television. The army of artists worked around the clock to complete the shots, exhausted by the production but proud of their finished work. For the music of the show, Dennis McCarthy once again lent his talents to the production. Peter Loritzen and other artists had created the visuals for the opening credit sequence of the show. Working from an idea by Rick Berman to show the history of exploration and flight, the team was able to cut together artwork and stock footage combined with several original visual effect shots which would guide the audience into the future. McCarthy had originally composed a piece for this opening, which has since been retroactively named Archer's Theme.
However, in an effort to differentiate this new series, Berman and Braga hit upon the idea of using an actual song for the series. As the visuals for the sequence were coming together, a placeholder song was Beautiful Day by U2. However, the royalty fee for using this song would have likely been far too high and so it was thought an original song was needed instead. Composer Diane Warren, a songwriter whose work has been performed by Bon Jovi, Celine Dion, Cher and many more, wrote the theme song for Enterprise. The result was Faith of the Heart, performed by Russell Watson. Fan reception to this song and my own opinion on it is something I'll get into soon. But after a lengthy development and production schedule, and with the added pressure of reinvigorating the Star Trek franchise on the small screen, the first episode of Enterprise debuted on the 26th of September, 2001. For decades, we've dreamed of traveling beyond our galaxy. This fall, we will. Neptune and back in six minutes. A new era of discovery is about to begin. Let's go. Enterprise launches Wednesday, September 26th on UPN. Enterprise's premiere episode Broken Bow kicks the series off very well and sets up the potential for the series nicely. I would say it ranks comfortably above the debuts of The Next Generation and Voyager, but not quite on the same level as DS9's Emissary, although it is close. The change in style, tone and characterization is readily apparent from the outset, and after a lengthy binge of previous Star Trek shows, it's quite a refreshing change of pace. From a young archer complaining about Vulcans holding humanity back, to a Klingon warrior crash landing in a cornfield, it's all familiar Star Trek elements, but the context and execution is new and exciting. It succeeds in making the Star Trek universe feel grounded and grittier than before. The move to fully digital visual effects has some mixed results. For the most part, the environments and spaceships all look top-notch. This was already something mastered in Deep Space Nine and Voyager, and in the 16 by 9 aspect ratio, many of these outer space shots look terrific. The weaker CGI elements are the digital doubles for the cast, and the other CGI people in various shots. They're never all that convincing, and do pull the viewer out of scenes at times, but in general, this is a great looking series. The production design is some of Herman Zimmerman's best work on Star Trek as far as I'm concerned. You can really see where modern space exploration technology like that of NASA ends, and the familiar Starfleet technology begins. The less slick and more cramped interior of the NX-01 Enterprise is another element which really grounds the setting. Everything feels far more tangible and real. As for the theme song, I count myself among those fans who absolutely despised it on first viewing. When Enterprise debuted, fan reception to the song was harsh to say the least, but I have to admit, I've warmed to it over the years. Conceptually, there's nothing really wrong with the idea, and the lyrics nicely embody that pioneering spirit of Star Trek, which perfectly complements the visual element of the opening credits. My main gripe is that I wish there was a larger sound to the instrumentation. Russell Watson is clearly singing his heart out, and it would have been nice if he was backed by some orchestral strings and brass instead of what sounds like a band. That gripe aside though, I think it's fine. I don't love the song, but I have caught myself humming the tune every now and then. The cast are certainly well introduced. There's some crusty banter between Archer, Paul, and Trip, which nails that Kirk, Spock, McCoy style trio which Berman and Braga were attempting to replicate. But even outside of these main three, Hoshi, Reed, Phlox, and Mayweather are all given very memorable introductions. And it's again refreshing to watch less perfect, less evolved human characters in Star Trek as opposed to the superhumans of the 24th century we've become accustomed to. Where I think Broken Bow doesn't quite hit the bullseye is with its plot. The Sulaban are a striking new foe with a unique design and creepy contortion abilities, but their scheme to start a war within the Klingon Empire and Klang being the one carrying evidence of this doesn't have anything to do with our main characters really. 
it's difficult to get emotionally invested. If the episode made clear how failing to stop the Sulabon would hurt humanity or the Vulcans, we'd feel a greater sense of jeopardy. That being said, it serves its function well enough as a way for humanity to prove itself on the larger stage of galactic politics. And the debates between Trip and T'Pol about rescuing Archer from the Sulabon base managed to ratchet up the tension well enough. There's also plenty of well-staged action and impressive stunts to keep things exciting. While I don't think Broken Bow is the greatest Star Trek pilot ever, it's certainly one of the best. Not super emotionally impactful, but a fun sci-fi action-adventure romp which shows a lot of promise for the series to come. Broken Bow was watched by over 16 million viewers upon release, and received positive critical reviews. While the ratings weren't as strong as Voyager's debut, it did exceed Voyager's ratings during its latter half, and proved a Star Trek show could still function as UPN's flagship series. After such a strong premiere, fingers were crossed this high quality would continue in Enterprise's first season. Unfortunately, Season 1 doesn't maintain the standard set by Broken Bow. It's not awful by any stretch, but it's incredibly uneven. There are flashes of brilliance, but a huge number of episodes also fall back on very tired Star Trek tropes. Brandon Braga has since spoken about the turbulent first year of Enterprise, saying he was largely disappointed by the final result. Although production of the series was generally smooth, the writing situation was anything but. On the one hand, Berman and Braga were aiming for a radical new take on Star Trek, something more character-driven and smaller in scale, the right stuff in space as Berman often pitched it. However, the duo have said Paramount and UPN executives never fully embraced the idea, pushing for more traditional episodic outer space adventures. But at the same time, to be fair to these executives, Braga has also admitted he and Berman weren't quite up to the task they initially set for themselves. By this point, Berman had been working on Star Trek for 14 years, and Braga had been working on it for 11 years. Their colleagues Michael Piller and Jerry Taylor had already chosen to step away from the franchise some years earlier, in large part due to creative exhaustion. Thus, it's easy to see why Berman and Braga ended up falling back on such familiar story ideas. Coming off of Voyager Next Generation, there was, and, and even Deep Space Nine, which I didn't work on, there was a core group of writers that kept that stuff high quality, consistent, and just getting it done. And they all, they weren't with me on Enterprise. So I really, that was really tough. You know, I really felt the loss of my companions. I felt the, I, never more acutely had I felt the loss of Ron Moore. Um, my trusted partner, um, we'd had a, a falling out, but we pa had patched it up by then. But by then it was too late, you know, Ron had gone off to do other things. I just, my support system fell out from under me. This results in quite a schizophrenic tone and style for Enterprise's first year. On the one hand, many episodes absolutely live up to the show's mission statement. Episodes like Strange New World, Terra Nova, Breaking the Ice, these are episodes which truly make the idea of space exploration special again. Setting foot on an alien world is a big event. Humanity's previous colonization efforts were sometimes disastrous, and sometimes the biggest threat to our characters isn't some strange space anomaly, but a simple fight for survival against the elements. A lot of this material works wonderfully with the ongoing tension between humans and Vulcans. While the Vulcans were instrumental in humanity reaching the stars, they also held back human technological progress, creating a lot of resentment. And while many Vulcans see potential in the human race, they also see humans as primitive and volatile, perhaps not ready to explore the cosmos. While the season takes on an episodic format, there is a consistent dramatic thread throughout the year which develops from episode to episode. It's a brilliant tool used to explore fascinating themes themes about the human condition, as well as develop many of the characters. If this had been the sole focus of the season, I could see it being one of Star Trek's best. Unfortunately, the tendency for writers to fall back on tired tropes detracts from this. Just as many, if not more, episodes feel like Star Trek plots and concepts which we've seen countless times before. In some episodes, encountering new aliens for the first time is incredibly important, intriguing, or even terrifying. But in others, Enterprise bumps into many more aliens like it's just another day at the office. In some episodes, humanity's meddling with another culture is nuanced, with clashing but understandable perspectives. But in other episodes, the Enterprise crew renders simplistic moral judgments on other societies as if they're the flagship of the yet-to-be Federation. The show's identity never fully coalesces. A lot of installments in Season 1 don't feel like stories a writer was itching to tell, but rather something needed to fill up the schedule. It can be quite frustrating to watch. 
Despite this uneven quality though, an undeniable triumph of Enterprise Season 1 is the Andorian Incident. Enterprise diverts to the Vulcan Temple Pajem to learn more about the site, but are shocked to discover the temple inhabitants have been taken hostage by a squad of Andorians, who believe the temple is a smokescreen to hide a listening post aimed at Andorian space. As the Andorians search the temple and interrogate the hostages, the Enterprise crew get to work on a rescue plan. Part of the appeal inherent to Enterprise's premise is in seeing familiar Star Trek elements in a new, previously unseen context. The Andorians, first seen in the original series, have always had a striking design to them, but in Enterprise they are given a fully fleshed out identity. A highly disciplined militant society inhabited by individuals who prize loyalty above all else. While this makes them formidable enemies, it also offers a lot of creative potential for nuanced characterization. In a way, the Andorian scene in Enterprise take a lot of cues from the Cardassians in Deep Space Nine, which makes it all the more fitting to see this group of Andorians led by the legendary Jeffrey Combs as Commander Shran. Shran is the embodiment of why the Andorians are so successful in this episode and throughout Enterprise in general. Shran is brutally efficient and threatening, not afraid to get his hands dirty or cross moral boundaries in service of the Imperium. But he's also a man held to a strict code of personal honour. Shran's blunt honesty as a character conjures a wealth of great dialogue for him which Combs delivers in a witty and captivating tone. He constantly steals scenes from the regular cast. It's no wonder Shran was brought back numerous times in the show. What solidifies the episode as being great for me though is when it's revealed the Andorians are right and Pajem is in fact a facility used to spy on Andorian space. Many fans at the time objected to the portrayal of the Vulcans in Enterprise as they're quite the departure from the coldly logical but ostensibly peaceful diplomats and officers we had seen before. But I've always found their depiction in Enterprise very compelling and interesting. The Vulcans, despite appearances, are far from perfect. While their sense of logic may have tempered the impulses which nearly led to their destruction, no society can be entirely fixed overnight. Therefore, when Enterprise presents us with stubborn, snobbish, dismissive, and at times even totalitarian Vulcans, it adds a lot of welcome depth to such a familiar Star Trek race. In Enterprise, we don't just see humanity's evolution, we also see the Vulcans and indeed the Andorians evolve. If part of Enterprise's mission statement as a series is to show us an origin story of sorts for the Star Trek universe we're so familiar with, then episodes like the Andorian incident and bold, surprising creative choices are essential in telling that story. It's one of those flashes of brilliance which early Enterprise should have capitalised on more. Another example of the nuance Enterprise sometimes missed out on is seen in the episode Dear Doctor. While Phlox drafts a letter to a colleague, Enterprise encounters the Valakians, a pre-warp species dying out from an aggressive disease. They also encounter the Menk, another sentient race who share the Valakian homeworld but are largely second-class citizens. As Phlox works on a cure for the disease, he discovers something profound about the Menk. Dr. Phlox is one of the few Enterprise characters who is truly great from the start of the series and remains great until its end. John Billingsley instills Phlox with a delightfully chipper and amusing personality which makes him naturally quirky and funny but never buffoonish as was the case with Neelix in Voyager. This makes Phlox's moments of moral outrage very impactful and Billingsley is more than capable of tugging at the audience's heartstrings when required. But it's Phlox's alien perspective which makes him such a a great part of the ensemble. The culture he comes from is similar to humans in several ways, but also very different in others. Flux's moral compass isn't always exactly aligned with the rest of the crew, and his unorthodox medical techniques sometimes tip him over into mad scientist territory. But that's exactly why his interactions with the crew work so well. It's a learning experience for all of those involved. One of these learning experiences is the crux of Dear Doctor. While at first the episode threatens to become a tiresome and clumsy racism allegory as many early Enterprise episodes often did, Dear Doctor sharply detours into much more interesting territory. Phlox discovers the Menk are regarded as second class because of their intellectual capacity, capacity which is rapidly growing, trending towards equaling or even surpassing the Valakians. Phlox and the Enterprise crew soon find themselves in the middle of what could be a crucial evolutionary development on this planet. Much in the same way Homo sapiens surpassed its other competitors on Earth, perhaps it is the evolutionary destiny of the Valakians to die out and the Menk to become dominant. Yet at the same time, Enterprise could help the Valakians cure their disease, but in doing so, what would that mean for the Menk when their intelligence matches the Valakians? Could that interference fuel a racial conflict which wouldn't have occurred if Enterprise didn't interfere? 
This episode essentially serves as the origin story for what would become the Prime Directive. The fact is, there are no easy answers here. I think it's telling that for some fans, Dear Doctor represents one of the best Enterprise stories, whereas for others, it's easily the worst. The smaller picture is, there are people in need and Enterprise can help them. But the larger picture is, Enterprise's help could lead to untold suffering. It's a tough moral quandary, and the episode itself doesn't fully resolve it. Ultimately, Captain Archer decides that it's simply not their place to determine the next course of evolution for this world, and they can only leave it in peace. Framing this conundrum from Phlox's perspective, someone who, despite his differences with humans, did take a version of the Hippocratic Oath, is the perfect way to explore this narrative theme while keeping the events focused on the characters. The Prime Directive has driven Star Trek plots before, but it's thanks to the context of Enterprise's setting that the idea behind the Prime Directive is given far more depth than ever before or since. The finale of Season 1 sees the Enterprise become embroiled in the much foreshadowed Temporal Cold War. The Temporal Cold War was an arc established in Enterprise's first episode, but was not the creation of the writers per se. As touched on earlier, Rick Berman and Brannon Braga believe that the executives at Paramount and UPN never fully embraced the idea of doing a prequel show, instead preferring a show taking place after Voyager. According to the duo, the studio demanded they write something into the show which could elude to future events. Thus came the Temporal Cold War. While the concept certainly had potential, the duo also found it a little at odds with their vision for Enterprise. Nevertheless, the arc was established in Broken Bow with the mysterious figure nicknamed Future Guy, assisting the Sulaban by helping them advance their technology and carry out missions for him for some unknown end. This arc was then revisited in the episode Cold Front, in which crewman Daniels reveals himself to be a Federation temporal agent from the 31st century, who reveals to Archer that the Sulaban's actions may have altered the intended course of history. While it is true the concept is quite interesting at face value, time travel or time-related stories had already been done to death in Star Trek Voyager. Therefore, the temporal Cold War in Enterprise again feels like the creatives falling back on a trope rather than presenting an exciting story idea. I also feel like the inclusion of this arc was an attempt at some metatextual preemptive shielding against the expected criticism with regards to a prequel. Being a prequel, those making the show know the audience already knows how things will turn out for the humans, Vulcans, and Dorians, etc. And so this line about events transpiring differently to how they should feels to me like a strategy to add back in some suspense. The trouble is, this period of Star Trek history is new to the viewer, and so even if the show killed off Captain Archer, for example, and insisted this was a sharp departure from history, it wouldn't hit the audience like it should. If Enterprise was depicting events which Trekkies were already familiar with, altering established events would carry real weight. Quite paradoxically, however, this also has the effect of arriving back at the prequel problem in the first place. The audience already knows where the timeline will end up, and now we have a character in the show making sure there's no deviation from those expectations. In an attempt to add in tension, it actually threatens to take it away. If that sounds confusing or nonsensical, that's illustrative of exactly why time travel was such a tired concept by this point in Star Trek. Regardless, Shockwave in and of itself is a decent enough two-parter with some solid suspense and action. The highlight comes at the end when the Enterprise crew have to justify their first year record of exploration to the Vulcan High Council and convince them why it means they're ready to explore further despite their mistakes. It's a nice scene which harkens back to that pioneering spirit intrinsic to the original remit of the series and provides some enjoyable, if surprising, character beats too. Ultimately, it's representative of the show itself by the end of its first year. Unfortunately, general reception to the first season of the show was mixed to negative. Following the well-received first episode, criticisms were levied at the characterization and tired plots of many episodes. Fan opinion was also turning against Rick Berman and Bran and Braga over perceived canon violations. Technologies such as view screens, holograms, and cloaking devices, which were previously established as having been invented much later, made several appearances in the show. 
While elsewhere on this channel I've stated how this kind of thing doesn't really matter to me personally, for certain Star Trek fans these contradictions were illustrative of Berman and Braga's supposed lack of knowledge and or respect for the franchise. This is quite a ridiculous claim from my point of view, and the seemingly more advanced technology seen in Enterprise is just a natural consequence of the audience's perception of the future having evolved since the original series. I remember we had problems even back in the Next Generation days where um we had this very futuristic computer that sat on Picard's desk, and then Steve Jobs comes out with a computer that's much cooler and much more streamlined. So how can we say that this is something that's 400 years in the future when something is available at Best Buy that looks more futuristic? In fairness to everybody, there's never just one side to the issue. The fans who said, eh, it's my daddy Star Trek and I want to see it, I've seen it a thousand times before. Might also be equally pissed off if it's like, hey, this isn't Roddenberry's vision. Bullshit. I mean, it's extremely difficult to try and find a way to create a show that the bulk of existing fans want to watch, while at the same time appealing to new fans who've already judged Star Trek. It's, I don't know that it's even possible. Brannon Braga has since said how disappointed he himself was with the first season. Therefore, for season two, he decided to fire most of the writing staff and attempt to overhaul the creative approach to the show. Season two of Enterprise is overall an improvement over the first, but there's still somewhat of an identity crisis going on. The original vision of doing the right stuff in space seems to have taken even more of a back seat, but that being said, there is a high number of standout episodic adventures. There's even some attempts at serialization, with Dead Stop acting as a direct sequel to the preceding minefield. The former sees the Enterprise wade into a field of cloaked mines, left there by the mysterious Romulan Star Empire. When one of these mines attaches itself to the hull, Reed and Archer race against time to disarm it before it blows, and Archer exhausting every available option before employing the last resort of simply detaching the hull panel and leaving a trapped Reed marooned in deep space. It's an exciting and tense plot with some snappy dialogue between Archer and Reed. The episode also succeeds in making the Romulans mysterious and even scary again, which is impressive after they became such a staple of previous Star Trek shows. Due to the damage sustained in Minefield though, Dead Stop sees Enterprise travel to an entirely automated space station for repairs, a station which can customise itself to suit any client's needs. While the station's advanced technology is able to repair the damage quickly and efficiently, the crew soon discover its dark secret when Mayweather is kidnapped and hooked up to a computer which uses the brains of live subjects for processing power. It's worth noting that by the end of this season, Travis Mayweather is essentially reduced to a glorified extra. It seems after the character's backstory of being born and raised on cargo ships was explored, there was simply nothing else to do with him, or rather nothing else was attempted. Which I think is a shame as Anthony Montgomery is certainly a capable actor who would have likely excelled had he been given much more to do. However, what I enjoy most about these two episodes is that it showed how Enterprise could have had its cake and eaten it too in satisfying both the creative staff and and studio execs. Leaning into the consequences of the ship and crew after the events of episodes could have been a way of embodying that near-future NASA mission style of Star Trek Berman and Braga had originally envisioned. But at the same time, it would have left plenty of room for the more traditional episodic Star Trek stories the studio was more keen on. It's a shame this approach was only really taken with these two episodes. That being said, there are still plenty of one-off stories to enjoy, such as the excellent Carbon Creek, a tale told by T'Pol of the real first contact between humans and Vulcans, which occurred when a science team, led by T'Pol's ancestor, becomes stranded on Earth in the 1950s. It's a wonderfully light-hearted and enjoyable little romp, recalling some of the flavour of City on the Edge of Forever, only less tragic. The middle of the season also sees the return of Shran in Cease Fire and the temporal Cold War ramping up in the thrilling Future Tense. There's even an appearance by the Borg which manages to actually work. In season one, Braga admitted the inclusion of the Ferengi in the episode Acquisition was a decision made out of pure desperation. However, the Borg appearing centuries before their first encounter in TNG's Q Who works by tying events in with first contact, with Borg drones being found in the wreckage of the sphere destroyed by the Enterprise E. It's a clever way of getting around established canon, and after the Borg were somewhat defanged in Voyager, their awakening in the Arctic ice, reminiscent of John Carpenter's The Thing, allows them to reclaim their sense of threat, and the subsequent chase as the drones flee Earth, assimilating as they go, packs in plenty of edge-of-the-seat thrills. It's good stuff. 
Then again, Season 2 of Enterprise does also feature some of its worst outings, such as the cringe-worthy A Night in Sickbay and the god-awful Cogenitor. However, I feel at this stage it's worth addressing a more consistent creative flaw with the series in both Seasons 1 and 2, and that is the treatment of T'Pol, or rather, I should say, the way the character is frequently sexually objectified. It's entirely possible the writer-producers were attempting to replicate the success of Seven of Nine with T'Pol, with casting breakdowns often making reference to the character's striking beauty. Jolene Blaylock certainly fits the bill in this regard, but her experience as a model also lends the character a physical screen presence which enhances her performance. The perfect posture, natural poise, and lower speaking voice succeeds in conveying to Paul's sense of superiority she feels over most humans. The character's physical appearance is not the issue. What is far less forgivable is the tendency for episodes to make any excuse to have the character stripped down into her underwear and end up in some kind of comically sexual situation. While this trend isn't confined to to Paul, with Hoshi being contrived to appear topless in Shockwave Part 2, it is most apparent with her character, and it's to the show's detriment. Although Enterprise had debuted with strong ratings, the series was shedding viewers at an alarming rate, even by its second year, and it's possible these ridiculous scenes with T'Pol were a cynical attempt to keep viewers' attention. Blaylock herself criticised this, saying, You can't substitute tits and ass for good storytelling. You can have both, but you can't substitute one for the other, because the audience is not that stupid. You can't just throw in frivolous, uncharacteristic, well, bull, and think that will help the ratings. This becomes especially absurd in the penultimate episode, Bounty, in which T'Pol is stricken by her pawn far starting too early. An episode which mostly follows a compelling plot in which Archer is kidnapped by a Tellarite trader is brought down by cutbacks to T'Pol prowling the decks of the Enterprise like a sex-crazed lunatic. It's just eye-roll-inducing. Now, there's absolutely nothing wrong with having a sexy character. For example, see characters like Vala of Stargate SG-1 or Inara of Firefly. But T'Pol is clearly not written to be that kind of character. It's something I wasn't sure about mentioning in this video, but when I was re-watching Enterprise recently, I found it hard to ignore. It does a disservice to the character, series, and also the audience. Behind-the-scenes circumstances took a turn for the worse, however, following the release of Star Trek Nemesis. Nemesis, which I covered in Part 14 of this series, was a box office bomb on release and met with a mixed and negative critical and fan reception. Because Rick Berman was also the producer of that film, he and the creative team behind Enterprise were suddenly under much closer scrutiny from studio higher-ups. Because of this closer scrutiny, continuing fan animosity, and worsening ratings for the show, Berman and Braga knew Enterprise needed a major shake-up for its next season. The result was a radical and ambitious story arc which would begin with the season 2 finale, The Expanse. After a round of story notes from Paramount Television, Brannon Braga was the one to suggest a story arc surrounding a new alien antagonist known as the Zindi. He said, I always wonder, what would Earth have been like if dinosaurs had evolved to become intelligent? And not only that, but insects, birds. What if it happened, there was a simultaneous evolution into intelligent organisms, and they all lived together? In collaboration with executive producer Chris Black and director David Livingston, Bracker was able to gradually create an outline for a season-long arc for Enterprise's third year. This arc would see Earth attacked by a prototype superweapon which kills millions. After an investigation, the Enterprise crew are sent to a chaotic region of space to track down the creators of the superweapon known as the Zindi, a society made up of five distinct intelligent species who all evolved on the same planet, but even they are being manipulated by a higher power. This was set up in a cliffhanger episode at the end of Season 2, The Expanse. However, it was during production of Season 3 that the look of the Zindi and the details of their art came together. Visualising the Zindi was a collective effort from several illustrators, visual effects artists, and production designers. While the Zindi are five different species, illustrator John Eaves made sure to include a subtle facial feature they would all share to convey their common ancestry. At Rick Berman's suggestion, both the aquatics and insectoids were depicted entirely using CGI, which was very ambitious for the time. On the writing front, while Braga and Berman continued to work with regulars like Mike Sussman and Chris Black, writer-producer Manny Koto also joined the team. Koto was an unabashed, die-hard Star Trek fan, but more on him later. Season 3 also saw a change in the show's title. Whereas seasons 1 and 2 were simply titled Enterprise, 
the Star Trek name was officially added to the title for the remainder of the series. The theme song was also altered slightly, with a more upbeat tempo and extra guitars added to the instrumental. Personally, I prefer the older version. Season 3 of Enterprise is an enormous leap up in quality. Rather than falling back on familiar tropes and tired Star Trek plots, the status quo has been completely thrown out, and the result is one of the best seasons of Star Trek television ever made. At least in my opinion. While it's even further from the NASA mission concept the show was originally meant to be, it still succeeds in bringing something new to the table and shaking up the Star Trek formula in bold and daring ways. Though there are occasional detours to more familiar Star Trek fare, for the most part the season is entirely focused on this single serialized story. While it isn't the right stuff in space, the context of being set in humanity's early days of space exploration before the founding of the Federation is used to ratchet up the stakes. While Berman and Braga had a bad habit of hitting the reset button on Voyager, here Enterprise's status as a lone Starfleet vessel cut off from any support is fully embraced. The risk to the ship is magnified even further by the Enterprise venturing into the Expanse, a dangerous unexplored region filled with bizarre spatial anomalies and aliens. This is a setting and an arc which also uses the characters well and gives most of them something more interesting to do than usual. T'Pol's confidence in her mental discipline is shaken after an encounter with a lost Vulcan science vessel and her subsequent addiction. It's a great way of turning the tables. Up until this point, T'Pol nailed the usual Vulcan character type, where their strict, unemotional, purely logical perspective clashes with the more passion-driven human crew members. It had been done before with Spock in the original series, but the larger context of humanity's sometimes strained relationship with the Vulcans in general made returning to this dynamic appropriate. But in Season 3, it's to Paul who is struggling to maintain her sense of logic and letting her emotions get the better of her, often looking to Phlox for support. It upends the usual character dynamic and provides us with a good showcase of Jolene Blaylock's acting range. For some of the supporting characters, it's a bit of a mixed bag. Mayweather essentially has nothing to do in terms of real drama, but Hoshi is a little more active. She gets a decent enough episode focused on her, and she serves an essential function in helping Enterprise find the Zindi. But it's a far cry from how promising the characters started out. In early Enterprise, she was the character who lent weight to the idea of encountering something truly unknown. She was far from a veteran space traveller and found it difficult to settle into life aboard a starship. Hoshi arguably embodied the more relatable, less perfect kind of character Berman and Braga were aiming for from the outset far better than anyone else. Fight or Flight is a brilliant example of the character being used well. Like Mayweather though, the initial conceit of the character soon runs its course, and by season 3 it's clear the show is struggling with exactly how to develop Hoshi any further. Malcolm Reed probably gets the most to do dramatically outside of the central trio. Introducing Major Hayes in the Mako Squad is another shake-up of a familiar Star Trek trope. Ever since the original series, red shirts are well known to die-hard Trekkies and casual viewers alike, barely named characters who join the main cast on an away mission solely for the purpose of being killed off after a few minutes. But the Makos are a complete subversion of this idea. They are an elite squad of highly trained marines who operate with brutal efficiency and sport a collection of high-tech weaponry and equipment. The squad members are played by recognisable recurring actors and stunt performers, which allows the series to showcase some impressive action and stunt work but also lets the audience become invested in the team and keep track of who has and hasn't survived each mission. Considering the presence of the Makos and their leader Major Hayes, it's obvious the show risked making Malcolm Reed redundant as a character, which is why it's clever to literally make this into a character arc for this season. Despite Reed's capabilities as a security officer, it's obvious Hayes and the Makos have skills which far exceed his own, and Reed being the traditional British military type he is, often lets the less rational side of his mind get the better of him, becoming consumed by petty jealousy before inevitably developing a grudging respect for Hayes, and Hayes likewise for Reed. This character arc also serves as a thematic thread which explores the tension between Enterprise being built as a ship of exploration sent off on what is ostensibly a military operation. 
This is in fact a tension which has existed in Star Trek from both a creative and fan perspective. The optimistic future of Star Trek is meant to be a future where humanity has moved past the need to use violence to further its ends. While Starfleet is an organisation which champions exploration, science and discovery, it does also serve as the de facto military organisation of humanity. Before Enterprise, Deep Space Nine showed plainly how an eternally optimistic view that all problems can be solved without violence can be not only naive, but also dangerous. Yet it's also arguable that if Starfleet did become fully militarised, something intrinsic to the human spirit and the larger societal benefits scientific discoveries often bring would be lost. This is often cited as a reason for Gene Roddenberry's intense dislike of Nicholas Meyer's take on Star Trek, as Meyer heavily leaned into depicting Starfleet as a more militarised space navy. And among fans, heated discussions are often provoked whenever Starfleet officers are portrayed as anything but hopeful peacemakers. This is a conflict which also informs Archer's character development throughout this season. Scott Bakula was pretty much the perfect choice for the captain of this series. He has a natural warmth and wisdom to his screen presence, but he also always comes across as being much more down to earth and relatable. He can moralise just as well as Patrick Stewart, but with an emotional vulnerability and passion which makes him far more approachable. Archer is essentially our vision of a modern day NASA astronaut who just happens to be commanding a ship in Star Trek. Episode like Season 2's brilliant first flight sees Archer literally distilled into this archetype, and Bakula nails the performance. However, this characterization is somewhat of a double-edged sword. When earlier Enterprise properly leans into its intended creative vision, Captain Archer truly excels, but when the show fell back on cookie-cutter Star Trek plots, Archer sometimes came across as quite bland. Enterprise Season 3 finds the perfect middle ground in having Archer embody that astronaut archetype, but having him confront more outlandish, high-concept sci-fi to develop the character further. He begins the arc successfully holding on to his bold explorer persona, trying his hardest to always do the right thing, even when it isn't the easiest thing. But as the Enterprise continues on its mission, Archer is forced into making more and more difficult moral choices, with only a split second of time to think. This results in Archer committing some quite brutal and morally questionable acts, such as torturing a prisoner and destroying manned outposts to avoid detection. With each act, we see Archer growing increasingly weary and guilt-ridden, as if his very soul is eroding as the mission continues. However, this sense of desperation is integral to the success of the Zindi arc. As mentioned earlier, this season embraces the accumulation of damage and the struggle to stay supplied, which Berman and Braga often sidestepped in Star Trek Voyager. The space battles, anomaly encounters, injuries and deaths sustained by the crew, the consequences of these events aren't simply brushed under the carpet at the start of the next episode. Instead, in embracing these consequences, the season continuously builds up the tension until breaking point. Trip is one of the characters most affected by this element of the story, as it's his job to keep the ship moving despite the constant stream of obstacles they run into. The character begins the mission already mourning the loss of his sister in the first Zindi attack, a trauma which simmers beneath the surface in every episode. Much like the Enterprise itself, Trip has to battle to keep going, with cumulative damage gradually wearing him down. What makes all of this fantastic thematic and character development work so well though, is that it's all supported by razor sharp plotting. Essentially anything that can go wrong for the Enterprise crew in their mission to stop the Zindi, does go wrong. They arrive in the Expanse with the thinnest of possible leads, and even following that is a pitched battle in which the entire crew is almost enslaved by a barbaric mining operation, and the only man with information that can help is killed during a rescue operation, only managing to provide another slim lead with his dying breath. The Enterprise is almost torn apart on a daily basis by spatial anomalies, but they can't protect against them because the substance they need to do so would eventually kill to Paul. The precious few supplies they have are stolen by pirates, valuable data they've gathered about the Expanse is erased by religious fanatics, an operation to obtain a prototype of a weapon designed to destroy Earth entirely is almost a disaster when they are betrayed by the Andorians. It just goes on and on. What's remarkable is that none of these twists and turns come across as contrived or unbelievable. Instead, the Enterprise is simply in such a disadvantaged position to begin with that it's a miracle they're able to last as long as they do. It places the audience firmly on the edge of their seats and doesn't let up until the credits roll. The entire story is also elevated by extra twists concerning the Zindi themselves. They are far from the megalomaniacal evildoers we may expect. In fact, the Zindi, 
much like humanity, believe they are in a fight for their very survival, assisted by mysterious extra-dimensional aliens who have misled the Zindi into believing humanity will destroy them in the future. But as Enterprise discovers, these aliens are in fact the Sphere Builders, massive artificial planetoids which are slowly transforming the Expanse in preparation for an invasion. The Jeopardy then comes from many directions, with several ticking clocks and impossible tasks laid out in front of our main characters. The race to stop the Zindi superweapon from destroying Earth, the fight to reveal the truth about the Sphere Builders, traveling back in time to stop a bioweapon being deployed in Earth's past, all of it framed by characters on both sides and their developing relationships among their own people and with each other. With some other temporal shenanigans from episodes like Twilight, which sees Captain Archer infected with the disease which stops him forming new memories, carrying us to the future where Earth has already been destroyed and humanity is on the verge of extinction, and E Squared, in which the Enterprise crew encounter a duplicate of their ship, populated by their own descendants from another timeline, and the Zindi arc is fit to bursting with high-octane action, tension, character drama, thematic depth, and imaginative sci-fi ideas. The arc reaches its height with the episode Azati Prime, where Archer's suicide mission to destroy the Zindi superweapon is turned into a deadly trap. Soon Enterprise is ambushed by a squad of Zindi ships which pummel it into a listing lifeless wreck with no perceivable hope of escape for the crew. It is a jaw-dropping cliffhanger. The near-miraculous survival of the ship and crew provides only a temporary respite, as for the rest of the season the goals are the same, but with even fewer resources to accomplish them. The fallout of Azati Prime finally sees Trip reach breaking point in the episode The Forgotten, as he struggles to write a condolence letter for one of his fallen engineering team. I tried not to see her any differently than the other seven million. So I've spent the last nine months trying to pretend she was just another victim. But she's my sister to Paul. My very sister. More devastating, though, are the actions taken by Archer. In order to reach a crucial meeting point which could stop the Zindi superweapon, Archer orders a raid on a civilian ship to obtain a much-needed warp coil. This is truly Archer's darkest moment, as he becomes the very thing he had once fought against. You're stranding us three years from home. Why are you doing this? Because I have no choice. Energize. The final three-parter, The Council, Countdown, and Zero Hour, is the ultimate culmination of all plot and character threads of the arc. The result is a nail-biting, emotionally gripping, epic showdown, with Enterprise finally putting an end to the Sphere Builders, the Zindi descending into a civil war, and Archer fighting one-on-one -on -one to destroy the superweapon. By the time it's all over, I always feel like I just let out a breath I had been holding since the beginning of the season. What damages the end of the arc, though, is the intrusion of the temporal Cold War plot. As Enterprise returns to Earth, they receive no acknowledgement from Starfleet Command, and instead find themselves in the midst of an alternate World War II where Germany has invaded America, assisted by aliens from the future. While the temporal Cold War was potentially intriguing in seasons 1 and 2, and facilitated some solid early outings, by this point it was easily the least interesting part of the show. Tying it in with the Zindi arc feels like an afterthought, and after such an excellent, action-packed, emotionally powerful storyline, to muddy its end by this detour to a riff on the man in the high castle, involving alien antagonists we've never seen before, well, it's a pretty big letdown. The two-parter Stormfront is perfectly fine on its own, but it's in completely the wrong place. Despite this stumble at the end, however, Season 3 of Enterprise remains overall brilliant. It did sidestep its premise, but it was able to utilise the strengths it already had and combine them with others to create one of the best seasons of Star Trek television ever made. Surely this was enough to redeem the show and the Star Trek franchise in the eyes of fans, critics and top-level executives, right?
despite how great the show had become by its third season, Enterprise continued to struggle in the ratings. While it had received some critical praise, general audiences simply seemed disinterested, and the harsh criticisms levied at Berman and Braga didn't go away. Star Trek had seemed to lose pace with what the wider popular consciousness wanted from science fiction television. The year prior saw the debut of Battlestar Galactica, developed by Star Trek alumni Ronald D. Moore. The series captured the zeitgeist in a profound way, with its darker reimagining of the 70s original and a tone and style more closely inspired by the West Wing and 24 rather than Star Wars and indeed Star Trek. Regardless of which show one may prefer, this was a radical departure from what was expected of science fiction television, and it sparked a lot of interest from that wider audience Star Trek had lost over the years. The move away from more pulpy, colourful, and dare we say silly looking sci-fi would also see shows like Lost and Heroes becoming must-watch TV. The reinvention of familiar sci-fi and comic book tropes into more contemporary, human-centric drama and intrigue was in some ways exactly what Rick Berman and Brandon Braga had envisioned for Enterprise. Unfortunately, next to these smash hit shows with their more cinematic and gritty aesthetics, franchises like Star Trek seemed rather outdated by comparison, regardless of its own quality. It is perhaps for these reasons Enterprise garnered such little public interest. As a result, Rick Berman and Brannon Braga were deemed by the executives at Paramount and UPN as certainly not having their fingers on the day's cultural pulse. While on paper the two remained on as executive producers, Brannon Braga has made clear since that the two essentially lost most of their creative control over the show. In their place, Manny Koto, who had written a number of well-received season 3 episodes and polished much of the Zindi arc, replaced them as showrunner. Although Koto certainly had a love of the material, he faced a number of challenges when it came to crafting his new vision of the show. For one thing, the budget was slashed severely, from an alleged budget of $1.7 million per episode to a paltry $800,000 per episode. For this amount of money to go further, Koto and the production team decided to switch up the format of the show. Rather than standalone adventures or even the heavy serialization of Season 3, Season 4 would be broken down into a handful of multi-part episodes, with only 5 out of the 22 episodes being standalone stories. This allowed the production team to save money on building as many new sets or creating new costumes and makeups from week to week, with many of these multi-parters in fact able to use pre-existing materials already. The show transitioning from being shot on film to being shot on digital may have also been due to budgetary limits. Season 4 of Enterprise is markedly different from its preceding years, but continues the stride started in Season 3. The show is much more confident in its creative vision, and the characters are much better developed. Despite the abundance of multi-part episodes coming out of budget constraints, this actually helps elevate the quality of stories. Rather than these slashed budget reducing the scope of the episodes, they in fact feel more sprawling in scope. Character arcs are more detailed as they have more time to breathe, and Koto succeeds in carrying over that great sense of tension which was so characteristic of the Zindi arc. It's no surprise Koto himself would end up as a producer on 24, as his sense of pacing and escalating action translates very well to espionage and political plot lines. As good as Season 4 is, however, I personally still prefer Season 3. This is due to Season 4's over-reliance on fan service at times. While the format is fresh, I feel like the episodes rely a little too heavily on inside references a bit too often. The first three-parter alone features augments left over from the eugenics wars, led by a stunt cast Brent Spiner as Dr. Soon's ancestor, and Khan himself being name-checked at one point. Then we have a detour to the Mirror Universe, where our characters acquire the USS Defiant, which vanished in the TOS Epithetholian web so we can visit the old 60s sets, fist fight with a Gorn, and see the Constitution class lay waste to a fleet of starships in HD. It risks becoming far too self-indulgent, but for the most part the writing is of high enough of a calibre to pull it off. The cat and mouse games between the Enterprise and the Augments are thrilling, and the discussions surrounding genetic engineering only become more relevant with each passing year. In a Mirror Darkly is just mountains of fun, with a hilarious twist given to the first contact sequence, customised opening, and the cast clearly having a blast playing their cartoonishly evil counterparts. Where it does fall down for me though is with a two-parter depicting the Klingons losing their forehead ridges and an explanation being given as to why they look so different in the original series. I've said many times before on this channel that I simply do not care about this. 
Conjuring an entire plotline to reconcile some continuity oddities is just a fundamentally uninteresting place to start any story from. For me, this was sufficiently addressed in Deep Space Nine's Trials and Tribulations, where the idea of even speculating about this is played largely for laughs. Early in the discussions, we knew, well, there's these Klingons that don't look like our Klingons. Gotta address it. Hard to put Worf in a room with them and say they're Klingons and not comment on it, boys and girls. This was like an issue that had been chewed around Star Trek and Star Trek fandom for many years. Well, what's the explanation? There's not a single explanation that is anything less than preposterous. Genetic mutation, oh, there's the bumpy-headed guys lived on the northern continent and the human guys in the southern continent. Oh, they were conquered by another, I mean, it was just all these like ridiculous Rube Goldberg ideas. And the truth is it was a makeup change. There's no way around this. So we just said, just have Worf say it's a long story and leave it at that, you know, and that's fine. For me, the strongest outings this season are the three-parters surrounding the Vulcans and the seeds of the Romulan Earth War. The Forge, Awakening, and Kir Shara begins with the bombing of Earth's embassy on Vulcan, which soon sets to Paul and Archer on the trail of the Cyranites, a supposedly dangerous rebel group hiding out in Vulcan's harshest desert known as the Forge. However, with the help of the Enterprise crew, Archer and T'Pol eventually discover the bombing was staged by the Vulcan High Command to use the Cyranites as a scapegoat and covertly launch an invasion of Andoria. I mentioned before how Enterprise portraying the Vulcans as a less than perfect people living under a sometimes totalitarian state was a great way of revamping such a familiar Star Trek icon. Most of Star Trek is content to let the Vulcans remain in the background as stoic ambassadors or ship commanders, but Enterprise succeeds in actually making a compelling story about the Vulcans themselves. This is an epic story about a watershed moment in history for this society and its people. It gives us a window into a rich history and culture which until this point has really just been window dressing, and the three-part format gives the events an epic quality. There are multiple nations at stake, the future of this entire region of space. While the the revelation of Romulan manipulation threatens to cheapen the themes of the story, the episode also makes clear this attitude in Vulcan society was merely stoked by the Romulans, but not created by them. In some sense, the three-parter functions as more canon-centric fanservice, showing the audience how the Vulcans of Enterprise transition into the Vulcans we're more familiar with. But it doesn't come across as filling in a blank on the Vulcan wiki page, but instead exploring an unknown chapter in Star Trek's history, which is really what Enterprise was all about from the start. Similarly, Bamble One United and the Anar provides us with another tantalizing glimpse at a pivotal moment in Star Trek history. Enterprise is brought in to mediate a rising conflict between the Vulcans and Dorians and Tellarites, who have all reported attacks on their ships by the others. However, as Enterprise investigates further, they soon discover someone else is pulling the strings. The United Federation of Planets, a bastion of equality, peace and prosperity, being birthed out of a devastating war has always been a captivating piece of Star Trek world building. Season 4 plants some enticing seeds for this arc, but none more overtly than in this three-parter. The Romulans being inadvertently responsible for creating the alliance of planets they tried so hard to prevent is a nice bit of dramatic irony. However, the episode also shows that these opposing factions putting aside their differences in order to face a common enemy is by no means easy. The history between these three factions is long, filled with so much bitterness and prejudice that when we finally see the beginnings of this alliance, it's truly satisfying. Much like the Vulcan arc, watching these events unfolding doesn't feel like hearing a wiki being read aloud to you, but more like the natural culmination of several long-running story threads which have existed in the show since its beginning. For me personally though, the crowning achievement of Season 4 is its last two-parter, Demons and Terra Prime. At a conference proposing an interplanetary alliance, a dying woman tells Trip and T'Pol that they have a child. The following investigation leads the crew into confronting Terra Prime, a xenophobic anti-alien organization, which has had a disturbing popularity surge after the Zindi incident. This is Enterprise doing a story which couldn't really be done in any other Star Trek show. While xenophobia, discrimination, and racism have been tackled at length in Star Trek before, metaphorical alien societies have always stood in for our own. But in Enterprise, Terra Prime being a homegrown movement really helps the message have more impact. 
This is a period in Star Trek history where human beings are still learning and old base prejudices still linger. The episode expertly lampoons how these kinds of beliefs are both narrow-minded, ignorant and often hypocritical. This is illustrated by Terra Prime seizing control of a weapons platform on Mars which only exists thanks to humanity reaching out to explore space to begin with. And when it's revealed Paxton, the leader of the movement, suffers from a genetic disease which he can only treat thanks to alien medicine. These elements cleverly highlight the strengths which come from unity and diversity, strengths which have created the very world that people in Terra Prime now insist is under threat from those who helped make it. But the emotional throughline of the two-parter is sustained by a focus on Trip and T'Pol's relationship. From the very beginning of the show, these two characters have had a clear chemistry, though this was often expressed in Spock-McCoy-type bickering. Naturally though, it didn't take long for this bickering to reveal itself as a byproduct of obvious sexual tension between the two. It's a predictable kind of romantic arc, the two people who always argue like a married couple eventually falling in love is well-trodden ground. But the well-written dialogue, chemistry between the actors and their individual performances makes it very sincere. This is a relationship which develops slowly and earns its catharsis when the two finally admit their feelings for one another. Catharsis which is then undercut by tragedy when circumstances outside their control continuously stop them from coming together. The end of Terra Prime in which T'Pol and Trip mourn the sudden heartbreaking loss of their child they never knew they had is easily one of the most powerful scenes in the show. The uh, delegates at the conference, they've uh, asked about the service for uh, For Elizabeth. It's fitting in a way that the tragic death of their child is due to the flawed cloning techniques used by Terra Prime and not due to the incompatibility of differing DNA. It serves as symbolic that despite their differences and all the hardships they've endured, the two of them still have a future together. It is but one facet of a larger message concerning different peoples and cultures finding a way to live in peace and thrive together. But showing this into Paul and Tripp's relationship ensures the idea really reaches the audience on a deeper level. As production of season 4 continued, it seemed the borrowed time the series was sustaining itself on had finally run out. Enterprise's ratings by this point seemed to be in a downward spiral. Season 4 was watched by an average of less than 3 million viewers, a far cry from its 16 million debut. But unfortunately, Enterprise was also suffering under the weight of the larger forces at work in the corporate world. By 2005, Star Trek's corporate owner Paramount Studio was undergoing some major changes. I don't have time to get into the exact details of all the moving parts, but safe to say the administrators of the studio were rapidly changing positions and responsibilities. This meant the usual support Star Trek had at Paramount wasn't there, and instead it was the executives at UPN which had primary oversight. However, the regime at UPN seemed largely disinterested in Enterprise, and according to Berman and Braga, never understood the show properly. Because the network was getting younger and younger, and they were really trying to to deal with an audience of, of, of young women, young girls. It was seriously suggested to us that in the mess hall, we have a... A band playing. A, oh, wait. A band of young, young, but, but, young but guys. They, but they also were like, and maybe a different group every week. We're, we're going to get the hottest young bands out there. And we were like, where are we going to put them? Well, you have that restaurant on the ship, don't you? I don't, they didn't know what it was called. They didn't, I think I used, I was trying to pitch a story for the season. I used the word hull. They didn't know what a hull this was. was. We, that, that's, that's one of my favorite stories. We were pitching this story. We're explaining how we are writing an episode where there's a fire out on the hull and the guys have to get into spacesuits and walk out on the hull and one of them, da 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 and they're all, there's like five of them sitting around the table and they're all nodding and kind of, kind of going. And then this one person in question, one of the highest, if not the highest ranking person in the room, said, I just have one question. What's a hull? <laughs> <laughs> Due to a lack of support at a network level, declining ratings and pop culture disinterest, Star Trek Enterprise was cancelled during its fourth season. The announcement was made to the cast and crew during production of In a Mirror Darkly Part 2. Although a fierce letter writing campaign from remaining fans ensued after the public announcement, and even an effort to crowdfund a fifth season which raised over $32 million, the decision had been made. In truth, Enterprise had been a candidate for cancellation since its second season, the Zindi storyline for season 3 and Manny Koto becoming a showrunner, both being attempts to revitalise the series. 
Even so, Koto had been surprised by how long Enterprise had managed to stay on the air and had started making plans for a fifth season. Koto's plans would have seen the show continue to build up the Earth-Romulan War, the return of the Kazinti and an ongoing Mirror Universe storyline which would have served as a follow-up to In a Mirror Darkly, and Shran becoming a regular cast member. The production team had also wanted to refit the Enterprise with a secondary hull, bringing its overall design closer to that of the Constitution class. Unfortunately, however, these plans never saw the light of day. Because of this sudden cancellation, the production team had to scramble to stitch together some kind of conclusion to the series. To this end, Berman and Braga decided to repurpose an episode idea they had come up with the previous year, in which Commander Riker from Star Trek The Next Generation would simulate Archer's Enterprise on the holodeck in the 24th century, facilitating a crossover between the Enterprise and TNG casts. The resulting series finale, These Are The Voyages, is easily one of the worst send-offs for a television show, within and without Star Trek. At some point during the events of the Next Generation episode Pegasus, Riker simulates the NX-01 Enterprise on the holodeck depicting its final mission. This final mission sees the Enterprise, some years after the events of Terra Prime, embark on a mission to rescue Shran's daughter before Archer attends the signing of the treaty which would birth the Federation. It's a truly head-scratching send-off for the Enterprise crew, having them play second fiddle to Riker and Troy, but even that framing device is just bizarre. Pegasus is a fine TNG episode which I highlighted in my retrospective on that show, but even within that story, this doesn't make much sense. Riker is trying to work up the courage to tell Picard the truth about the Pegasus, and Troy suggests simulating the NX-01 Enterprise which will help him with this… somehow? And he ends the episode ready to speak with Picard, but in Pegasus that conversation never happens, so this entire exercise is ultimately pointless. Seeing where the Enterprise crew end up is also a huge letdown. I don't know if Berman and Braga were writing in complete isolation from Koto, but all this time jump illustrates is that these characters apparently didn't develop in any way. We never see Trip and T'Pol conclude their romance, Shran never joined the crew, and everyone is exactly the same as where they left off in Terra Prime, and their all-important final mission is a pretty run-of-the-mill rescue operation. Again, a very odd creative choice. But easily the worst aspect of this final mission is the death of Trip. It's bend-over-backwards contrived to have these random pirates sneak aboard the Enterprise and Trip lead them to a suicidal trap. Considering all the close calls the Enterprise crew have had, especially in seasons 3 and 4, this comes across as a totally pathetic and needless character death. And right before the alliance of planets which births the Federation, essentially the origin story of Star Trek itself, comes to fruition, the holodeck simulation abruptly ends. It's readily apparent the production team simply had neither the time or resources to craft a satisfying ending, which makes me wonder why they didn't attempt a quieter, character-driven episode like Season 4's Home, or just don't do the episode at all and have Terra Prime serve as the finale, which in a way seems more fitting. Everything about these other voyages is utterly frustrating and completely baffling. There are some fans who would say that sentence sums up Enterprise as a whole, and at one point I maybe would have agreed. But over the years, fan appreciation for the series has grown. After multiple rewatches, I've been able to better recognise the strengths of the series. While it did stumble in its first two seasons, the same is also true of The Next Generation, Deep Space Nine and Voyager. The only difference is that those shows had five more years to sustain the stride they hit after those early teething problems. Enterprise was unfortunately caught in the wrong place at the wrong time. It was rushed into development at a time studio executives knew Star Trek was suffering from franchise fatigue. Those same executives would soon be gone, and the administration that replaced them simply didn't understand the show. Its creative team wanted badly to make something fresh and new, but even they were limited by exhaustion. But by the latter half of the show, things had really started to improve. Season 3's Zindi story arc is some of the best work which has ever been done in the franchise. Season 4 embraced its limitations and succeeded in creating a set of fan-pleasing, emotionally resonant and character-rich stories for the final year. Had Enterprise lasted a full seven years like the others, I have no doubts it would be just as highly regarded and pop-culturally recognisable as TNG, DS9 and Voyager. However, in spite of everything it did well, the wider TV landscape simply wasn't on its side, and indeed it seemed Star Trek itself was in need of a rest. Following Enterprise's cancellation, the official Star Trek website and magazine were shut down. Star Trek The Experience closed its doors. UPN, which Star Trek was once a flagship show for, shuttered. Audiences, writers, producers and the franchise's owners 
thought it was best to move on for the time being. But were also open to one day revisiting Strange New Worlds and Strange New Life when the time was right. Even though Enterprise's final episode is pretty much a train wreck, there is a scene I like at the end. It's only a little thing, but seeing as how no new Star Trek would be gracing any screens for the first time in 18 years, this was the end of an era in a way. And this final sequence is a fitting way of closing the book on Star Trek, at least for the time being. To boldly go where no man has gone before. Star Trek had finally been given the rest it so desperately needed, but just as history had shown before, Star Trek wouldn't stay away for long. Thank you for watching. If you like these videos, subscribe and hit the bell icon to stay up to date on my new uploads. If you want to help the channel grow, join my patrons or my YouTube members where you can see videos early as well as some other exclusive content. Speaking of which, I'd like to quickly thank all of my patrons and members who are now appearing on screen. Have a good one, and as always, live long and prosper.